Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond, and I would like to start out this video with a quick shout out, some love, to my buddy Overflow. So, Overflow is sharing and releasing out to the world a beginner malware analysis course. You can find it on his website, it is only £39, and it is an awesome beginner-friendly course with five hours and more of video material discussing x86 assembly, analyzing Visual Basic macros, extract configurations, and learning all about different kinds of encryption algorithms. So, I love this course because it is super duper hands-on, everything that you're doing Doing is going to be walked through along with Overflow in his actual demonstration of reversing some malware, analyzing what it really does, and each section is dedicated to its own kind of snippet of video, so they're all really bite-sized. Super easy to digest, and you can see this gets into some really good stuff. .NET information, x86 assembly, of course, using IDA Pro, the free rendition, using a debugger, checking out common API attacks, and moving into real-world case studies and different examples that you can see out there in the real world. So I really, really recommend you guys go check out this course. Honestly, I'm a big fan. In fact, if you want to use my discount code, just my name, John Hammond, all caps, no spaces, you can get 15% off. But there is a catch. It is the first 100 50 people to use this discount code. So if you're interested in the beginner malware analysis course, please go check it out. Link in the description and on the video for some reason. I don't know why, because you can't really copy and paste that. But please go check it out. Thanks so much. Okay, now let's get to the video. So in this video, I want to show you guys the HTER function and that command within Vuln Server and how we can exploit it and cause it to, with some shellcode, send a reverse shell connection back to us so that we can control the machine and interact with it as a victim compromised program. So if you haven't heard of Vuln Server before, I really recommend you go check it out. You can find it online. I think it's Stephen Bradshaw that had created it. Check out his GitHub, download it. It's a simple .exe executable that is a simple command line server where it'll open up a socket on the network that you can connect to and you can interact with simple command line functions or commands and each of them is intentionally vulnerable in a specific way. So you can learn, practice, and educate yourself on how to exploit them. I use Vuln Server a lot when practicing for the OSCE, or the Offensive Security Certified Expert Exam, so I want to showcase a little bit of it here. Okay, so I have this set up with a Windows 7 virtual machine that is going to act as our server running Vuln Server. So I'm going to fire up my command prompt, uh, and I'll move into the directory that I have Vuln Server download it into, and I'll go ahead and run vulnserver.exe. So it's going to start that program, grab its DLL, which it does need, and you can actually abuse that later on in some other functions, and it's going to wait for client connections. Okay, so as this is the server, we are the client, or our attacker machine. I'm going to end up just using my host because I'm connecting through a virtual machine right now. Um, but we do need to know the actual IP address of this target, of this host. So I'll fire up another command prompt down here, just verify what the IP address is. And in my case, it is 192.168.205.137. Okay, so... Now that this program is running, we don't know how it's vulnerable or where, what sort of code paths do we need to go down or what input or payload will actually crash this service. So let's go ahead and write something that will fuzz the application. Just send it a bunch of garbage input uh, variables and random data, nonsense and noise that will eventually have it topple over or spit up and throw up. So I'm going to do that back on my host with uh, a simple Python script. I'm going to end up using bufuzz. So let me make a directory, I'll just call it HTER, as that is the command I'm going to end up exploiting, and I'll create a bufuzz fuzzer script. I'm going to use Sublime Text here. So now that I have this Python script created, I will add my shebang line. I'm going to be using Python 3, because Python 2 is very dead. Don't use that anymore. And I'll import everything from Bufas. If you haven't installed, downloaded, or worked with Bufas before, again, really recommend you go check that out online. Uh, I think it came out of the Sully project, um, and originally before that, obviously a lot of people have seen Spike. That's a pretty common fuzzer, and it's used to that syntax S underscore for a lot of the commands and functions that it does, uh, and we'll actually see that just as well within Bufas. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we need to actually know the information for the target. So I'll just specify some variables for this. I'll say my host is 192.168, and that was 205. 
137, and Vuln server listens on port quad 9. So now we want to actually connect boilerplate Bufa's stuff. I admittedly don't know um, the Bufa syntax all that well, so forgive me if I look over at my notes every now and again, because I do need to actually go ahead and create what's called a session, and inside of that you have a target that is passed as a keyword argument, and inside of that you have a connection, which is created with a socket connection, and again, I don't admittedly have all of the syntax memorized, so forgive me for kind of darting my eyes to go make sure that's correct here. We need to specify the host and the port and the protocol it's going to end up using, which in our case is simply TCP. I'll save this, and I'm using black, uh, the Python linter, so it automatically kind of readjusted my format here, but hopefully you can read that and that's all clean. Now that we have that session, we can create a mode for what Bufa is actually going to work with, and that mode can be really anything. We can call it whatever we want. Um, what I tend to do is I just call it the name of the function that I'm abusing. So I'll go ahead and say s underscore initialize, and it just takes a string argument. I'll call it h-t-e-r, and that's just what we're going to have Bufas use as kind of a profile or really understanding the context of what it's going to do for its procedure when it goes and fuzzes the application. Now let's go ahead and explain how it's actually going to fuzz. So we need to specify how it will send its information to the remote target, to the actual victim here. We're going to specify that with a string, because obviously what we're going to type in and the input for the program is going to be something that we would send as a string. Actually, let me show you that. Let me uh, make sure that comes across okay. Let me do 192.168.205.137 on port 999. I'll go ahead and netcat to that so you can see what the vulnerable server looks like. If I run help, you can see all these different commands that we're going to end up working with. All of them actually don't do anything. They're just intentionally vulnerable. They don't actually serve a purpose. But the HTER command, you can see that is something that we could run with an argument. So we'll need to specify that as the kind of skeleton framework for how BooFuzz is going to fuzz the application. It'll send in anything or a bunch of fuzz data. So that's how that looks. Let's go ahead and create that. I'm going to specify HTER as the command that we'll use here. And then we actually need to specify a delimiter. But we need to make sure that each of these that we send along are not what we're actually going to fuzz. So BooFuzz needs a keyword argument, fuzzable, and we can just set that to false. The delimiter to specify that in our argument will actually be, again, a space, oh, and that should be false because we don't want to fuzz that information. What we do want to fuzz will come after that. So I'll specify that as a string, and we can say really anything here. Because that is the information that it is going to fuzz, and we don't need to specify that fuzzable keyword argument because it will be true by default. We don't need that in this case. Now, BooFuzz will know, okay, that is the point inside of the payload, inside of the input, that we are going to actually fuzz that service with. Now that that's created, we can go ahead and connect with our session, plug it in, and use this specific mode what we've initialized, that kind of profile for us. So let's do that. Let's use session.connect, and it's sget to actually retrieve that specific mode, and we've defined it up here. Let's just say, uh, specify how the fuzz syntax works. This is our fuzz point. Great, and now that we have connected to the service, Using that mode, we can go ahead and finally session.fuzz. And we'll send a bunch of data, send a bunch of nonsense. Okay, now that we've created that, we can go ahead and mark it as executable if you want, because we have our shebang line, or we can simply run Python 3 and the name of our script. So when I send this, it's going to send a lot of data. A bunch of stuff is going to that remote service. And sometimes we won't get a whole lot back, or it'll choke and slow down, because... If we go look at the server side, it received all these connections, and then it crashed. So we know, okay, we have fuzzed the program. We found a sensitive input, something unique that will cause the program to crash and throw up a bit. So I'm curious now, where does that actually happen? How does that happen within the program? So what we can do is we can hook Vuln Server up to a debugger. And I'm going to actually use Immunity Debugger to go ahead and do that. It's going to keep telling me that my Windows is not safe. I don't care. 
Now we can open up Immunity Debugger. Let's open a new program. I'll open Vuln Server. You can navigate to it. And you can see now Immunity will open up. On the top left side, you have our uh, disassembly of the program. The top right, you can see the registers and their values as we move through this program. We have a little dump here, and you can see the stack. At the very, very bottom right, which you can't see because my face is in the way, it is currently paused. This green, or excuse me, yellow little indicator that the program is not running. So we need to go ahead and hit that big red play button on the top. I think the keyword for that is, uh, hotkey for that is, what is it, F9? No, no, no. It should show me. Okay, F yeah, F9. I hit F5 and totally said F9. Did I say F5 or F9? Whatever. The program is now running, and now we can go ahead and send our fuzz script and have it break up and beat up the program again. So let's clear the screen, fire up boo fuzz, and eventually if we were to hop back to our program, we don't see it get anything just yet. Is boo fuzz still going? Looks like he's taking a break. Oh. Send any more stuff? Nothing yet. Okay, there we go. Now we crashed. All I needed to do was tell Windows to shut up. <laughs> so his instruction pointer is currently 11111, or eight ones, which is really interesting because normally if we're fuzzing, we might see some other values. And we do this manually sometimes. It's, we set a bunch of A's. We'll have hex 4141414141. 41, but this is a problem because we're just getting ones. So we could see maybe where we're actually sending that, why we're getting ones as our value here. So Bufas will save its results in a little SQLite database for us, which is really, really cool. Let's move into Bufas, see what this, and it actually stores them as SQLite databases. So this is when I initially ran it. This is when I ran it the second time. You can see just that timestamp is a little bit later. So let's go ahead and open that up in a SQLite browser. And I need to specify the proper file, 46. Okay. Now if I were to browse data in the steps table, we can take a look at what we've actually sent the program. Data is what's going to end up filling with a bunch of this information. And seemingly... Do we have anything that actually sent a lot of ones? And keep scrolling down until we find anything interesting. You can see all the interesting things that it uh, tries to send, like some specific commands for one kind of language or something that it might trip on, etc. Okay, now we see we're sending a lot of ones. H-E-E-R. They sent 130 bytes, 131 bytes. They sent 10,030 bytes. They sent 41,000 bytes, all of which were ones. So let's try and create maybe a kind of script on our own, a standalone script that will go ahead and have this program crash. So let's try that. I'm going to go ahead and move back a directory. So I'll call mine um, attacker.py. And I'm going to start a shebang line. And I'm going to use pwn tools because I like that. So from pwn import all, let's say our host can equal everything that we have had thus far, 137. The port number can simply be quad 9. And let's say s can equal remote of host and port. So let's send a payload. So we'll go ahead and create that. And I want that to actually be um, an array of data that I'm going to send. So we need to use bytes here because we're using Python 3. So I'll use that B prefix for all of our strings. I'll specify a space following that. I'm actually going to turn black off because I want to be able to create this how I would like it. And let's just send one, this that number one, I guess 4,000 times. And I'm going to go ahead and join this together. So now I finally have a full payload. And if I were to print that out, you could see it, print out payload. I will Python 3 attacker. You can see, okay, we have a bunch of ones that we're just printing out and we can connect to that service successfully. Let's go ahead and send that. Let's do s.send payload. And just to make sure that we don't lose our connection in case we didn't crash the service, I'm gonna actually say s.interactive rather than s.close at the end. So now let's see what we got. Um, looks like this program is crashed. 
So let's go back to our server, restart it with an immunity debugger. And now let's send our script. Theoretically, we sent it. Okay, and we did get it to crash. Okay, so all of the ones seemingly are crashing the service, but it's strange because it's not getting the hexadecimal representation of the ones here. It's not getting the little Indian format. Like if I were to go back to my prompt here, let's fire up idle. When we normally send data, when we normally check out a bunch of A's that we might hammer a program with, we would want to know what the actual hexadecimal value is. It's being packed in the little Endian format and is being filled in that EIP or the instruction pointer register. In this case, we're not having that happen. Because if I were to check out the ordinal value in the hexadecimal representation of a, a one character, it's hex three one. The three isn't in there. It's just straight one, 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 which is really, really weird. If I were to send a bunch of A's, would it have that same effect? Let me know if it's just the size of the input that is causing it to crash. Where is my sublime text? Let's just send a bunch of A's and see if that sends it. It's uh, control F2. If you're actually an immunity debugger, that is the hotkey to restart the service. Uh, control F2 and then F9 to run it. I'll go back and I'll run our script. Back to it, you can see it did crash and literally filled inside of the instruction pointer is the value A, 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 not 414141. So this is interesting. This is kind of a, an, uh, a different twist that we haven't seen before in some binary exploitation stuff. What we can do though, we can still track down and figure out where the sweet spot is, where we're overriding the instruction pointer and we could still actually get it to run some shellcode. We can still abuse this. So let me show you how we can do that. I'm going to go ahead and create a cyclic pattern of length 4,000 bytes. I'm going to use pwn cyclic to do it. And it looks like I need to specify, what is that? Oh, it doesn't need an argument. It just needs to know how long it wants to be without that tack L. So now I've generated a 4,000 set of patterns. But because this is all using the actual letters here, and they're going to be represented within the register as that value, not the hexadecimal representation, it's going to be much harder to track down how and where the sweet spot or the threshold or the offset is where we actually start to clobber the instruction pointer like we want in a regular buffer overflow attack. So what we can do is we can actually specify an alphabet for our cyclic pattern to use. I can use that with tack A when I use the pwn tool cyclic. And I'm going to use just the letters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I'll use A, B, C, E, F. Okay. Now that I've created 4,000 of these things, these values on their own could be used and determined where the actual payload might be. So let me use this. Let's go switch to our our script here, and let's say our cyclic pattern can equal a byte string of all of this, because it's not going to be interpreted in that hexadecimal way. We can say we generated that with, let me go back please to my terminal, and use this value here, and let's use the cyclic pattern rather than that long string of A's or 1's instead. Now, let's restart the service, run it again, so we can go fire off our script, attacker.py. We've sent it along, and it has crashed. Now we have a unique string, this 7B137A13. So let's take this selection, have it on our clipboard, and we can say, where is this going to exist within that long cyclic pattern? Let's use pwn cyclic. I'll use that same alphabet I used before, A, B, C, D, E, F, and I'll specify where is this string within the pattern. The problem is it's got to be four bytes in length, but we're using the actual, actual value in that case. So let's just use the lattermost half, and it could find it there at 2,043. So that's going to be our sweet spot. Let's try that. Let's see if we can actually uh, fill up, now that we know an offset is 2043, let's specify this command is how we found that. 
let's specify um, Bs of A 2043 times, and let's specify a new uh, instruction pointer. Let's use BBB, and I guess we'll need to fill it with eight characters in that case. So oh, we can use that offset variable that we just created. Now we don't need that cyclic pattern anymore, but let's see if we actually found the right threshold in the right spot for where we're clobbering the instruction pointer. Control F2, F9. Back to our script, we can go ahead and fire that off. And now you can see, okay, it looks like we have B, 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 B. We have a few A's in there. So we'll tweak that just a little bit. That's again at the very, very end. So we should, we should clear out those two bytes that we don't need. Um, 21. That's good. Just a little uh, trial and error to make sure, okay, are we getting the correct uh, offset that we want? Let's run this again. Run our script. And now you can see, okay, we have successfully fully closed up that instruction pointer with B, 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 B. So we've actually found the sweet spot as to where we are clobbering the instruction pointer, despite the fact that it's going to actually use the real value, not the hexadecimal representation of it. So now we can clean up our script a little bit. I actually want to make sure that we include all of the bytes that we thought that we would have used to crash the service with, because typically that's good practice. And it actually comes in handy for us when we do this, because then we'll be able to see, okay, now we can move to this next technique when we're doing our exploitation, uh, for when we're defining our payload. So I do actually want to include another buffer simply of C's rather than A's, so we kind of know where we're working with here. And let's go ahead and specify that coming after the new EIP. And let's actually define a new EIP uh, variable here for us. So I'll just use for Bs again. Let me switch that to new EIP. And then we can go ahead and specify uh, we'll use the total length as the number of Cs that we have minus, so we subtract out everything else we've already included in our payload. So our absolute payload length has to end up as this total value of 4,000 bytes. So we remove the total length, we remove the length of the kind of this prefix here. Let's actually specify that as another value. Let's specify command prefix. That can be that value. So we'll include that and oh, we can dynamically say the length of the command prefix minus the length of our offset minus the length of, oh, actually, since offset is an integer, we don't need to subtract that as length. It's already a number. And then we can specify the length of our new EIP. So now we'll make sure that our payload has to equal 4,000 bytes, still get our offset, still ruin and clobber EIP. So that should work well for us. Um, let me clear this up. So, okay, back to running just fine. Let's run our script. And now that we've fired off that payload, we can go check this out. Okay, so we have paused the program. We've caused it to crash. Our instruction pointer is filled with a value that we can control. Now we need to be able to potentially place in some shellcode. But how can we place in the shellcode? Where are we going to put it? Well, we should figure out where our buffer or that input that we're sending is actually being stored in the program. You might be able to notice it down here now if we're looking at the stack because this stack pointer, ESP, is actually being filled with the values that we're sending after our EIP overwrite. You can see all these Cs, that is our C buffer. If I right click this, follow in dump, scroll up just a smidge here, you can see all of our A's prior, our B's being our new instruction pointer, and all of the C values that we have following that. So now, what we can do is we can find some instruction within the binary that will act as our new instruction pointer and we'll call that and we'll have it do something that gives us more control. We'll have us jump, have the program's instruction pointer go to a location that we want to specify. In fact, we'll have it jump to ESP or this address here that is being filled with our buffer. That way we can control the C buffer with potentially something else, potentially shellcode. So let's go ahead and specify and find out how we can do that. Let's use Mona to find a jump ESP instruction. 
Uh, it's, uh, so the command here is Mona, with an exclamation point prefix, JMP to jump, and then R for register, and then ESP. So ESP now, okay, looks like Mona would tell us, and then it would hide away. Uh, I see this happen a lot. When that happens, I just like to run Mona itself with an exclamation point, and then I can scroll up in the results and kind of see what it had told me to begin with after I move through all this help file. So, okay, there we go. Now we can see some entries for our jump ESP instructions. They're all within this uh, DLL that we have loaded because of Vuln Server. And we can access any one of these, which will come in handy for us. So let's go ahead and grab this guy. Let's copy to clipboard the address. And let's go back to our script now. And we can say the new instruction pointer will go ahead and equal the value of this address packaged into little Endian format. So we'll use P32 from Pwn Tools. We have that uh, gone ahead and imported. But we know we have the restriction where the bytes that we send are being interpreted as their literal value, not in their hex representation. But we know they should be typically in their hex representation. So what we can do is we can hexlify or convert this packed little Endian representation of the address into hex. I'll do that with the binasci module. I'll import binasci, and then we can go ahead and say new EIP will equal binasci.hexlify that value. So now that we have our new EIP, we should be able to follow through with that within our immunity debugger. So let me go back to that code here. I'll hit Alt-C, I'll hit Control f 2 so I can restart the service. I'll hit F9 so it can run. I'll click into the disassembly and I'll hit Control G so I can go to a position and I'll paste in the address of what we're going to set a breakpoint on, which is that jump ESP instruction. Because now we want to make sure when we send our payload, when we fire off our attack script, we will call that or set our instruction pointer to that. So we will jump to the instruction pointer, jump to ESP and reach our C buffer that we know we can control. So let's go ahead and actually fire this off now that we have that working script. Let's run our attack script, go check it out in our debugger, and we can see, oh, we have hit our breakpoint. Program is paused. If I were to hit F7, which is to step, you can see, okay, now we're hitting our C buffer. Great. This is actually returning the int3 or uh, interrupt assembly instruction because it is literally including the C's in there. Um, that's kind of bad for us, but anyway, we're going to end up replacing that with shellcode. We know now that we are at least inside of our C buffer. You can see it can actually execute. It's facing an interrupt command. So let's go ahead and modify this. Let's change this now. Well, we can go ahead and use shellcode. So we need to go ahead and create some shellcode that will call back to us. So we'll need to know our actual IP address. I'll use IP ADR. Um, and I am 205, so 205.1 should be my actual IP address. So let's go ahead and let's use MSF Venom, tag P, specify payload. Let's say Windows reverse, or I think it's shell underscore reverse TCP. We'll specify our L host can equal our IP address. Our L port can set to anything that we particularly want. And we want to do something particularly interesting now because we know that this is in fact going to be interpreted as hex or its raw real value. We need to get it to be read in in its hex representation. So I'm going to use tack F so I can specify the format that's going to print out to me. And I'm going to specify hex is what we want to see. Okay, so now it has spat out our shell code. The problem is we have some null bytes in there. I kind of forgot to mention that tack B, remove bad bytes, and we certainly don't want any backslash X00 or the hexadecimal kind of backslash X notation for that byte of a null byte. So let's go ahead and remove that. Make sure that's not in there. Okay, now we have this payload, which we can go ahead and copy, move into our script, and let's just say shell code can equal all the bytes representation of that. I do want to grab that syntax so we can keep track of it in our script. This is how we generated our shellcode. And now we could potentially just include our shellcode inside that C buffer, but we should include a little bit of padding. We should include a buffer or kind of like a cushion for our jump instruction to actually land safely on our shellcode. Typically, you do this with a NOP sled or a NOOP, and that instruction is typically backslash x90 or 90 in hex. 
So what we can do, because we know that we need to pass this as real bytes, we're going to end up sending that as B90 times, let's say, 100. Doesn't matter how much we really use here, we just need some NOP sled, so it'll have no operation repeatedly, 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 and we will slide down that sled until we reach our shellcode. So let's go ahead and include that shellcode. Actually, let me specify this as a, another value here. Let's say NOP sled. I was going to say padding, but I guess we don't have to. And then we can include our NOP sled. And our shellcode is being included in there, so we'll have to subtract out our NOP sled now that we're using that. And we'll have to subtract out our shellcode. Good enough. Okay. So theoretically, now we should execute that reverse shell callback to us on port quad 4. Let's go ahead and see if it will work for us. What I'm going to do is I'm going to restart Immunity Debugger. Start the process. I'm going to create a new shell down here where I can listen on port quad 4, and I'll fire off our script, and there we go. We get a shell, just like that. So what we did was we took note of the fact that this HTR function was doing interesting things, where it would literally read in the raw literal value that we would pass along, not encode it into the little endian or hexadecimal representation. It would still be packed, it would still be little endian, but we would need to pass along actual hexadecimal bytes for what we were going to end up using. All of our raw bytes needed to still be in that hexadecimal format so our program could actually read it and understand it. Now that we have our shell, we could bop around, actually work on that target remote system. So, Okay, that's all I really want to showcase in this video. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I know this was a long one. I hope I kind of mentioned some interesting things, or uh, I guess I... For those of you that are kind of advanced or used to this, you've probably seen a lot of this before, and me explaining every little thing might not have helped. But for some of you that didn't have as much familiarity with this, maybe my explanations did help. So uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Hey, please go check out Overflow's course. It's really awesome. Beginner malware analysis. It's, it's good stuff. Like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys on the Discord server. See you later. With the purple, 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 with the purple,